Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Old Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. And man, what a fucking time to be alive and breathing and aware of all that is and was and ever will be. I feel like I have risen up and wiped the webs in the dew from my withered eye. And I don't know about you, but I feel like I am ready to see once again. No more hiding or chasing trails of smoke and reason. Anyway, there is a heck of a chat coming up for you with our guest, Jeremy Johnson. Jeremy is a man who wears many hats, as you will come to know over the course of this chat. But he's here to talk to us about a book he just published called Seeing Through the World, Gene Gepser and Integral Consciousness. Seeing Through the World introduces us, the readers, to the work of German-Swiss philosopher, poet, and intellectual mystic Jean Gepser, writing in the mid-20th century during a period of intense cultural transformation and crisis in Europe. Gepser intuited a series of mutational leaps in the history of human consciousness, the latest of which emerging was the integral structure marked by the presence of a concept Gepser called time freedom. Does that sound sexy or what? And Jeremy says that Gepser's structures of consciousness are as significant an ontological insight as Carl Jung's reality of the psyche. Yet until now, very little secondary literature has been available in the English-speaking world as it relates to Gepser and his work. And until now, very few podcasts have been recorded about Gepser and his work. But that is why Jeremy is here, to guide us through these structures and to show us how this integral structure of consciousness is a means of divination a crystal ball we can scry with to further illuminate what it is about our current age that seems so damn different. So a lot of scrying coming up indeed, and a lot of prying too, because we're pulling the lid back on that third eye of yours and pushing our way into that ear canal with another case of this nasty, nasty, sonically transmitted discourse. Jeremy Johnson is in the house right now. Enjoy. Jeremy Johnson, welcome to the show, man. You're a busy dude, so your time is much appreciated. Of course, I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Ryan. No problem, man. No problem. And, you know, I said you're busy. You wear a lot of hats these days. You're the uh, director at NeuroLearning. <laughs> you're the curator of philosophies at Reverlore Press, an editor at Reality Sandwich, and the author of the recently released book, Seeing Through the World, Gene Gepser and Integral Consciousness. And we'll get to the book in a minute, because it is why you're here. But I want to talk a bit about these other hats and how you got to be wearing them. So, you know, take us through a bit of your backstory here. How did you get to be such a uh, prolific hat wearer? <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so it's it's a bit of a happenstance sort of thing. I've always been very interested in, in, in topics like consciousness studies. And I got very involved with Reality Sandwich probably around 10 years ago or so at this point, which is just amazing how time flies. But I was just very interested in sort of countercultural publications and sort of the history of consciousness culture. Um, you know, it kind of grew up reading Alan Watts and Jiddu Krishnamurti and those kinds of folks. And I just wanted to stay kind of plugged in to, to where that was happening, you know, in the present. So as I mentioned, I got very involved with Reality Sandwich. And I think, you know, in retrospect, it makes sense because I have this kind of proclivity to, to publications and literature and, and the act of sort of culture building, right? So Reality Sandwich, of course, was this space that, you know, it's still around or still publishing articles, still doing some editorial work for them. And it was kind of a hub for, for a number of years. It just sort of exploded in a combination of, you know, consciousness studies and psychedelics and shamanism and the archaic revival of McKenna and all of that, right? So I like to follow the cultural spaces where there is some energy going on. And I'm very interested in individuals and communities and networks that come together and produce culture. You know, they, they cite each other. They are writing with each other, they're publishing each other, and they're building some kind of community in a culture that's not just sort of inward oriented and, and cloistered and monastic, but they're, they're engaged in culture some way, even if they're a so-called counterculture. So I don't know, I've just always found myself in those situations, looking for those spaces, looking to engage in the conversation. And to do that, I think with publishing, you have to write and edit and, and engage with other 
other writers, you know, and engage with their work, have them engage with you. And so that's how it really got started. Uh, my, my friend, uh, Jen Zart, she, she started uh, Revelor Press and um, asked me to come on board because of my background with Reality Sandwich and Evolver, that's another name for it. And now they're in New York City with the, in the Bowery with uh, the Alchemist Kitchen and they're doing work with the Assemblage. So it's kind of evolved a little bit to the, the next mutation, as it were. But uh, she liked my energy and I liked her energy and I just like how she works and thinks because it's a very similar idea of sort of building a dinner conversation and creating media where you feel like you're really engaged in, in the conversation. And of course, podcasting is very much like that. You know, I've been listening to your show for at least a year now or so. And uh, I definitely feel, even though we haven't really spoken in an auditory format before today, I feel very much like I'm plugged into, you know, the, the community that you've created here. So it's sort of a long story short, you know, those are at least two of the hats. Um, and, and everything else is, is, is semi-related. Neuro learning is sort of an educational space for, for all of these, these topics and questions. I'm kind of a, a uber geek. I love to read. I love to study. So that's another aspect of this is sort of the educational angle, kind of creating, as I, as I mentioned in my podcast, Mutations, a kind of philosophical counterculture, like bringing in more of this layer of deep thinking and deep study and deep reflection and, and self-reflection, because I think that's definitely necessary for the territories we're, we're often wandering deeply into. Yeah. And I mean, you are definitely doing all of those things at a high level from what I've seen. And obviously the through line between all of these projects that you're working on is your interest in consciousness. And that is a pretty popular word these days in a lot of different spaces, academia, uh, science, religious and spiritual communities. I'm actually hearing that word more and more in medicine and health and wellness circles as well. Mm -hmm. So I think before we get into the book, which very much deals with this idea, or maybe a subreddit of this idea, uh, let's mm -hmm. define that C word as you think of it. What does consciousness really mean? Is there one definition or many? Is there uh, consciousness with a little c and a big c? I'm just trying to figure out through your lens how we can better, I guess, understand this concept. Yeah, so <laughs> my definition of it is kind of an assemblage of different associated terms. But I think a general a description I might give consciousness is, is awareness. It's, it's some form of interiority or subjectivity. And that could be, that's a very broad definition, but it, it spans something like, well, you know, does a rock have some form of interiority? Certainly a living organism does, even a cell seems to have some form of agency in terms of, you know, going towards food or away from food, going towards danger or away from danger. So I do think in terms of a definition that that's a good working one, that there's an interiority behind things, by the, behind the appearance of things. Now, what that is, uh, in terms of is it is it ultimately a definable thing, uh, a quantifiable thing that we can understand with empirical sci science? I'm not as interested in that question as much as interested in exploring the nature of that subjectivity. And I think it's rather limitless in a way. You know, I, I guess I'm, I orient myself a little bit closer to the mysteriums in terms of like the the philosophy of mind debates and that. There's a unquantifiable interior dimensionality to, to being that we experience at a mundane level every day and that we experience, especially during sort of, you know, profound contemplative states or visionary states and so on. So that's my pragmatic working definition. So just to be clear, then you do not see consciousness as this, I don't know, maybe sort of etheric field, right? Mm, yeah, I, I don't see it as that per se, but it could be that as well. I mean, it could express itself as that. There could be, you know, some dimension of, of reality that is a little bit more etheric and there's an interiority behind that. You know, there could be a field that could be an aspect of it. Uh, I'm not a materialist, I would say, in, in, in the sense of, you know, thinking that consciousness is epiphenomenal to the, the activity of a brain or somehow epiphenomenal to matter. I think, you know, there, there are different levels of being that we could hardly understand, you know, at the moment. So I wouldn't pin it down to anything, but I, I'd be open to things like, you know, fields, you know, the collective unconscious is, is one idea and, and Sheldrake's cosmic habits and what he talks about, right, with the morphogenic field. I think that's, that's, there's something to that as well. 
but I, I wouldn't say it's only that, you know, it, it exists in, in objects as well. It exists in organisms as well and so on. Does that make sense? I think it does. Yeah. I'm just curious then, what do you make of theories of non-local consciousness and continuing consciousness after death? You know, those sorts mm. of things. Mm, yeah. I do personally believe that consciousness persists after death. I'm doing a little article right now for um, Evolve and Ascend publication uh, on Frederick Myers. And he's got a great book for, you know, a sort of Victorian parapsychology book called um, The Human Personality and Its Survival of bodily death. And I do think there's something to that, you know, esoteric and occult schools of thought often discuss this. And of course, there's been a lot of parapsychological research and transpersonal research on, you know, reincarnation and things like that. So it's possible I remain an agnostic as to how the afterlife actually works. But in terms of believing that consciousness does persist, and perhaps envelop time space in terms of our incarnation, sure. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and that's the only reason I ask is because this this show is called O Culture, and we have a lot of uh, mm -hmm. discussions around these same sorts of subjects yeah. from that perspective. So I mentioned your book up front. The namesake of the book is uh, Gene Gebser. I was unfamiliar with him for the most part. I had seen his name around, you know, online in some specific places, but wasn't really familiar with his work until I read your book. And I'm sure some of the audience is unfamiliar with him as well. So, you know, tell us a bit about who he was and also... I guess, why you wanted to write this book about him in the first place. So Gebser is a very interesting figure in the consciousness culture in that he's not very well known. There are certain niche communities like the integral community that I'm very much uh, involved with that took an interest in him, at least in sort of the history of American counterculture and the human potential movement. Ken Wilbur picked up his work. The yoga scholar George Feuerstein picked up his work. And there's been some small academic societies, like I'm involved with the Jean Gebser Society, that have also done some translation work for um, his primary text, Ever Present Origin. But for some reason, he just hasn't really been translated voluminously into the English-speaking world. But he's one of these interesting figures from the same time period as folks like C.G. Jung and Iliadi, and he was a participant of the Iranos lectures, if, if you're familiar with that in um, that, that sort of community in, in Switzerland that had these very interesting series of talks and discussions between, you know, these, these great thinkers on consciousness and archetypes and so on. He was involved in those circles as well. He was very much kind of fluid in the intelligentsia and artistic movements in Europe in the mid-century, born in 1905, and he passed away in 1973. And I think his insights, just in terms of the meat of the book and what he's bringing to the table and why he's been such an interest to individuals like Ken Wilbur or William Irwin Thompson, is he's looking at what he calls structures of consciousness. And to me, as I mentioned at the back of the book, I feel that that insight is, is just as important as Jung's insight on the archetypes and the collective unconscious or, or what Jung describes as the reality of the psyche, right? This, acknowledgement that there is some kind of ontology to the imagination, to the unconscious, to the images in the psyche and in the soul, that the soul itself has a reality. And that is a very profound insight that I feel Jung brings. But Gebser is sort of a, a, a scholar in a very similar breath to, let's say, Eric Newman, who was also a Jungian, in the sense that he was looking at this span of history and studying what he calls the phenomenology of awakening consciousness. So it's sort of the, we might call today cultural evolution, the evolution of consciousness. And he divides it up into a number of very important structures, which are sort of unique phenomenological relationships that we've had to time and space that have fundamentally transformed over history. And so his work, not just ever present origin, but a lot of his literature is looking at that in a very deep way. It's, it's looking at particular works of art, cave paintings, items and artifacts. He's studying etymology and sort of tracing the even the evolution of language to try to render transparent these transformations. And in doing so, he's hopefully, for the reader, engaging us and engaging these structures that constitute us. And I think maybe one way to kind of link it to your listeners and, and in terms of the, the subjects and the communities that I'm also involved in, in terms of the topic of a culture, one of the structures he has is the magical structure, and another is the mythical structure. And 
as many occultists often say that there is a a way of thinking and relating to the world as a certain reality to the occult, to the spirits, to relating to these energies and images and personalities, right? That there, there's a kind of an ecology of consciousness that we learn to navigate and work with. And a lot of pre-modern societies understood that. So Gebser is, what I like about him is that he's not, he's not so modernist that he rejects that. You know, some developmental thinkers about cultural evolution completely belittle that pre-modern understandings as sort of, well, you know, this was sort of a fantasy and and those things don't really exist, but they helped us develop into the modern world with science, etc. Gebser completely rejected that. And he was very open to this idea that, no, no, these are actually realities. You know, the spirit world is actually a reality for the magical and mythical structures of consciousness. And they learned those structures, those orientations towards the world that humanity inhabited for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, master that relationship. They master the relationship between nature and the human being and the soul and so on. And we have a lot to learn from that. And in many ways, we've kind of broken away from that. So that's sort of, <laughs> I'm beginning to kind of dive into you know, some of what he says in terms of like the unfolding of the structures. But mm -hmm. in general, this is what he was looking at. And, and maybe before I keep rambling, I'll just quickly mention that what got him started with all of this was he was very much a kind of a bohemian poet in the 1920s and 30s. And he was very interested in, in German poetry, especially the poetry of Rilke. And he felt he was kind of a budding scholar at the time. And he felt that somehow there was something going on in Europe, in the Occidental world, as he calls it, the European world, where language and art and even our sense of time and history were all transforming. And now we look back at it and we call it modern art in terms of, you know, surrealism and Dada and so on, and the new forms of poetry and, and the kind of post, we even call it, you know, the Museum of Modern Art has a lot of examples of this sort of experimentation with, with art and aesthetic. But Gebser was saying, you know, it, it goes deeper than that. There was some kind of fundamental reorientation going on. And that opened him up to considering the idea that this transformation has not just happened once, that our modern orientation is is very relative to the present and that there were other ways of being in the world and that this transformation could help us elucidate previous ones. And then so that kind of opened up his 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 grand study of, of uh, the evolution of consciousness. Yeah. So that last bit there that you just touched on about these sort of transformations, this is where the term mutations comes in, right? That's the term that he uses to describe these sort of uh, exactly. epochs of, of transformation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So another interesting thing about Gebser that's very contemporary is instead of seeing this as a linear sequence of development, these structures are in some ways more, more nonlinear, that when there is a fundamental transformation of culture happening, it's what we might call today, like, you know, the mathematician Ralph Abraham, who also studies cultural evolution, he calls it a chaotic bifurcation, and he uses chaos mathematics to describe it. But there are these discontinuous leaps, where an older structure of consciousness has sort of run its course, it's mastered a form of thinking and relating to the world, it's mastered an aesthetic, and it sort of outlived its, itself. It's sort of kind of gone into what he, Gebser describes as a deficient mode of consciousness. And so it, it, it begins to lose its efficacy or its capacity to deal with the unique challenges that a culture might be facing. And in fact, sometimes and in, typically it doubles down on doing the things that aren't working anymore. So the structural transformation is discontinuous. It's a leap into something ontologically different, into a whole other kind of world time space reorientation. And, and to give you an example, Gebser uses, and this is just a very useful thing that we kind of take for granted today, right? The The leap from what he describes as this unperspectival world of the medieval reality of, of icons and of the symbolic power and expression, let's say in medieval Europe, of, uh, of Christianity and the saints and the sort of vaulted sky that participants in that cosmos lived in. You know, it was a much more participatory world in which the psychic reality was very important, sort of diffuse through the world. But with the emergence of, you know, Renaissance painters who first sort of caught on to this, there was a need for articulating and discovering and expressing space, right? Three-dimensional space. 
So we have examples like Petrarch who climbs the mountain in Mount Ventoux in France and looks on the landscape and writes back to his, his mentor, a Jesuit priest, you know, a, a kind of a confession that he, he fell in love with space on that mountaintop and he feels bad about it because he should be contemplating his soul and not worrying about or not looking at, out at the landscapes at perspectival space. And then of course you have this like revving up of momentum of all of these Renaissance artists that are trying to master space and perspective. They're writing treatises, they're working on their paintings. There's the humanists that start coming out. Petrarch was one of these early humanists. So there's a sense of individuality that was emerging in this time and, and self-autonomy, right? So Gebser uses that as a good example to show, like, look how much culture was leaping into this new fundamental time-space reorientation. There was a new self, there was a new world, there was a new sense of time. Time had a kind of a directionality rather than a rhythmicity, not so much of a focus on the archetypal round of, of the gods and the seasons and the kind of the archetypal play of the seasons that kind of move in cycles. But now there was this movement of, of history, right? Of past, present, and future. And the concept of modernity is this sort of ongoing sense of linear progress, a sort of march forward into history, into clock time. So that's one example. There is this fundamental reorientation to time and space. And it's a very much, this is not an abstract thing, right? You can talk about it conceptually, but this is, really a way people were embodying themselves in the world, even if it was more abstract, even if the perspectival world that, that Gebser is articulating was more of an abstract world, it's, it's a kind of a, a spatialization of the body and, a, and a thinking, a thinking of, of the world as, as a kind of a spatial measurable sensorium where the eye becomes the primary arbiter of what's real, what the eye can measure. So Gebser was saying that this world, the world that we take for granted, that we moderns inhabit and live in was coming to an end. And he saw that happening, of course, you know, living between two world wars in, in the 20th century and seeing the breakdown of Western civilization going on like right before him. Right. So he even individually, he escaped Spain when the fascists were taking over. He was nearly shot at the border. He left Germany semi early on in, I think, the, the early 30s to move through Europe, through France, and then into Spain. And then he escaped Spain back into France, met, you know, folks like uh, Picasso there and some of the French intellectuals, and then escaped into the border of, of Switzerland, you know, an hour or two before it closed. And he escaped Spain an hour or two before his apartment was bombed. So he was kind of living in right in the, in the sort of the frenetic eye of the storm in terms of what was going on in Europe. And he really kind of palpably felt that there was some kind of breakdown going on with the fundamental orientation that Western civilization has had, you know. So he thought, and I think this is why he's so prescient for today, that this world is breaking down and this new aperspectival world is, is entering in. And it's as discontinuous a leap from the unperspectival world of medieval Europe as as we are today with the sort of linear time conception and, and, and measurable clock time and the kind of eruption of the occult and surrealism and magic and is this sort of a reintegration of everything that we've sort of lost in, in terms of the, the history of the Western psyche and then an opening up to these other realities, not just the occult realities, but for Gebser, the aperspectival is synonymous with time and time not as linear time, but as a sort of multi-dimensional simultaneity where, you know, the, the unperspectival world of, of magic and the occult and animism, the perspectival world of, of the individual and autonomy and space and sort of measurable science are, are transparent, right? So that's a term that he brings up all the time, diaphaneity and transparency. And it's this idea that we can kind of co-presently live and inhabit in all of these different modes of being in the world. And he thought that was unique to this integral consciousness, this integral aperspectival structure that he saw as at least latent in the 20th century, which connects us to today. And a sort of, you know, if this is the case, then we're still in that transformation. It's not over yet. We're still dealing with the fallout of, you know, everything from, you know, discussions around climate change to the breakdown of globalism and, and the economy. You know, we're really trying to rethink everything. We're still in the thicket of, of, this transformation. So I hope that explains it in a nutshell. 
It does in a nutshell. And I do want to make the audience aware that what you just described, this unperspectival world, this perspectival world, and the aperspectival world is what Gebser refers to as the three worlds or the three European worlds. So I just wanted to make sure that they knew that that's how he talks about it. If they see those terms around, that's what this is referring to. And there is a a part of this in the book, in the perspectival part where you're writing about it, that I, I want to circle back to. And it has to do with art. And you mentioned art in your answer there. And I just wanted to read something and then just ask you a, a very basic question about it. But, you know, Gebser, he mentions this eighth art of perspective. And then the other seven, uh, which you write, are sculpture, architecture, painting, music, poetry, dance, and performing. And I guess I'm wondering, like, how does... I don't know. How do you see perspective or how did he see perspective as an art form? Because I mean, when you, when you put perspective up against painting or poetry, like it doesn't really seem like it is the same thing, I guess. It doesn't have the same necessary Mm. quality as these other arts. So take us through that, like how you understand that. Sure. So, so I think for this idea that, that perspective is the, the eighth art really has a lot to do with what we understand today is kind of the, the cliche Renaissance painting, right? So Da Vinci's masterful expressions of human anatomy or uh, the kind of realism that he was able to bring into painting, that realism, that capacity to, to accurately depict space as it actually looks like, you know, in terms of the proportions of the body, dimensionality, so depth in a painting, the kind of realism that we associate with going to, you know, the museum of not modern art, but uh, going to the Met in New York City, for instance, and, and, and strolling through, you know, Western painting that, you know, we might yawn at a little bit. But at the time when this was coming online and people were struggling to actually master it and achieve it, there was a form of beauty in that realism. There's a form of achievement in understanding space and the realism of the body. So much so that, I, that a lot of Renaissance painters were describing their their predecessors of the medieval period as mistaken or or not understanding or even deformed. They're they're describing their expression of their imagery as somehow missing something and lacking something and not understanding something. And that that's perspective. That's sort of a, a depth of space in a painting or in an illustration. And and this kind of extends beyond just art, of course, right? It's it's sort of the explosion of measurable space in sort of every dimension of life. You know, medicine moves away from the kind of humoral orientation in terms of the body's humors and the kind of medieval medicine. Now, all of a sudden, we're studying the anatomy of the body. We're we're opening the space of the body, right? It becomes less about the sort of iconographic representation of saints and archetypal play of, of the Bible, right? In terms of the fall from Eden and Adam and Eve and the sort of the garden and that kind of thing and angels and and that whole cosmology gets closed down just gradually as we become more and more interested in material three-dimensional space and depicting that not only in our artwork but also in our sciences. And that doesn't start during the Renaissance. I mean, it really kind of began much earlier in in the Hellenistic world and there are other examples across different cultures where it is certainly emerging. But for Gebser, perspectivalism as a a fundamental orientation of the West and Western culture comes online right around then. So that's why, and and, and just to bring up the last part that he mentions that's very important, this whole idea that the eighth art, so Gebser is very uh, interested in, in language, right? So he playfully begins to associate eight with oct, right? and night with noct. And he kind of plays with this kind of root etymology of oct between, you know, eight and night in terms of German and kind of goes, this is the turn. This is the actual, you can see it in the language and you can even see it in the, in the word choice and the number choice that we're, we're using to describe this new form of consciousness. It's a move out of the twilight, unperspectival world of the psychistic signifiers, you know, in terms of, again, the archetypal drama, the night sky, the old sciences, the old kind of occult sciences that were mastered in in pre-modern times. It's a move out of that kind of night side real realm into the waking 
world of daylight, of Apollonic spatial wakefulness, where the eye, the waking eye becomes very important. It becomes a sort of the arbiter of what's real. And the individual who's standing now apart, who's woken up from this kind of dreaming of consciousness, is able to become autonomous and gain a sen- sense of self-determinancy and a- autonomy. And, and so that, that's sort of the knocked oct turn. That's the eighth art. It's this move into the waking perspectival world. And I would agree that it's, it's kind of a weird addition there. It, it feels a little abstract compared to the other ones, right? But that is also an interesting expression of this perspectival move. Now, I haven't brought up the, the actual four structures, the archaic, magic, mythic, mental, and then integral, but those are kind of a, a further discernment in terms of Gepser kind of developed that later after those three perspectival expressions in ever-present origin to begin to describe a little bit more detail in terms of magic versus mythic. But mental is generally perspectival. And, and so is this mm-hmm. mental consciousness that is very abstract. So it makes sense to me that anyway, that a very abstract oriented culture that's beginning to cut itself off from this participatory cosmos, this unperspectival involvement in the psychic and qualitative dimensionalities of the world and of spirits and of gods and so on, removing ourselves from that and moving more into more abstract forms of thinking and relating to the world. So it becomes more about the waking abstract mind. And so that form of art is, you know, is going to be a little bit more abstract, is going to be a little bit more quantifiable rather than qualitative. But of course, you know, Renaissance art is still very beautiful and there's a sense of beauty there. So there is some kind of a measurable quality to it. It's not a negative. It's not a pejorative to call something perspectival exactly. It's just that when it becomes fixated or immoderate or it kind of runs away from balancing itself with the immeasurable, with the unperspectival world, that we begin to have a problem. And that's exactly what begins to happen is, as time kind of marches on in this new perspectival world and we become less and less and less aware of this participatory cosmos, the, the spirit realm, the, the forms of occult thinking that kind of underlie abstract philosophical thinking that, you know, Joshua Ramey talks about in the Hermetic Deleuze, right? That Deleuze kind of traces philosophy into its occult origins. We lose an awareness of that occult background and that psychistic reality, and we become sort of uh, insomniacs, you know, we become too wakeful, as it were. And and that causes a lot, of, a lot of these problems that we start to see in the 20th century. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I use the term uh, woke a lot, sort of ironically, but that's kind of how I feel. So woke, I went back to sleep. Um, but <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> So you mentioned the structures of consciousness. I want to get back into those. But before we do, you brought up Gebser's interest in language, and I had a question around that. A very, very simple question, just about this term, a perspectival, which is, I, I guess, the time that you would say that we're living in now. He uses that prefix of a, you know, like putting the a in front of it. What does that mean exactly? Like, what's he trying to communicate or convey by adding that A prefix in front of that perspectival word? Great question. That really gets to the heart, I think, of what he is trying to articulate in all of his writing. And as I mentioned in the book, the A always stands in and signifies freedom. The quality of it is freedom, spaciousness, transparency. And I think the A for him is a way to to kind of go into a little bit of the the nitty gritty aspects of of why he chooses the A. So it's not a negation. He doesn't want to say, you know, let's negate the waking world. And he doesn't want to say, let's reaffirm and just go back into the dreaming, psychistic, animistic, occult world. He's saying that there's a way in which we can reorient ourselves that is almost it's open to those. It's open to those both. It's open to the waking and the dreaming and a kind of, you know, the idea of the title of my book is, is seeing through, but it's not a kind of perspectival seeing, right? There's a, there's a relaxing and an opening up. And I think that kind of description, it has some connection perhaps with contemplative insights in terms of, you know, the Tibetan Dzogchen describes this as a kind of a lucidity, right? Kepser describes it as a super wakefulness. So it's that ability to be soberly lucid through dreaming and waking. And so the A there doesn't want you to lean one way or the other, but just to kind of allow yourself to another word that Gebser brings in, but it's kind of easy to 
to grok, wear the whole and wear as in like being a wear, W A R E. So the A usually stands in for that. And the A perspectival is, I think, a very kind of technically freeing way to describe these three different general epochs, the unperspectival, the perspectival, and then the a perspectival that's kind of seeing through all of the forms of time and space expression and, and orientation in the world that we've had throughout all of human history, the sort of phenomenology of awaking, kind of seeing through that whole process and being present to all of it simultaneously. And the reason why I think we're in the a perspectival world is that increasingly we're being kind of forced to be super wakeful about super wakeful about all of that, you know, to understand what we've left behind, but then also not to reject everything that we've, you know, accomplished in this remoteness from the spiritual realities. You know, there's, there's an importance to differentiation and autonomy. Now alone, it's not good alone. It kind of runs us down into, you know, this kind of hyper individualism and isolation and, and, social fragmentation like we're seeing today, which is a problem of the perspectival. It can only make the cut. It can only do ratio and divide and measure um, with the perspectival eye that sees the kind of vanishing point. It can only spatialize. And because of that, it, it you know, if it only does that, then it isolates itself. So the A perspectival is this kind of freeing up our capacity to allow what has happened to be in terms of individualism and autonomy, but also recall and retrieve the unperspectival worlds that the wholeness of the human being is, is really kind of being able to to wear diaphanously the whole time you know the whole experience of becoming uh that we've, we've kind of gone through in cultural evolution so that's sort of what it means it, it's a very technical way of saying you know i don't want to affirm or negate i don't want to just talk about a dialectic of history it's not about that it's it's more it, it's it's a kind of a gentler and deeper originary, because Skepser has his term origin, right? What brings all of those into being? And I guess identifying more with that, which sort of allows the quintessence of any of these structures of consciousness to, to be in the first place. Again, this all sounds very contemplative, you know, it, it, and it, Gebser wasn't a contemplative himself. And I've always found this so interesting that, that he's so synergistic with contemplative practices. And he sort of began to feel that way later in his life when he was dialoguing with dt suzuki about zen but um it's just really just a minor observation in general how contemplative this a perspectival integral consciousness that he's describing really is yeah and you bridged us back nicely to the structures of consciousness but i have to detour for just a moment because you used the word grok a few minutes ago in that answer <laughs> and obviously that's a stranger in a strange land reference which is one of my all-time favorite books regardless of genre and I'm curious, I mean, obviously, you're a sci-fi fantasy guy, too, from what I've seen. Do you see any of Gebser's work seeping into fictional properties, whether it's through literature or film or TV now? Yes. And that that's really fun. That That's like a whole... This is going to be the subject of my next series of books. So as this book is uh, seeing through the world is kind of just an introduction to Gebser, but most of what I've been doing isn't really just studying, you know, his, his, his fundamental concepts, but really thinking about how we can apply them today. And if anything, you know, his, his approach is look at the art, you know, look at the, the myths that we're telling ourselves, the forms of artistic expression to get a sense of what and where consciousness is, right? Marshall McLuhan is, is another good example of a guy who describes things this way. And the artists are kind of the, the early harbingers of of mutations of consciousness. They they are working on these things, like just like the Renaissance artists were working on the scientific material perspectival world that was sort of coming online. Artists are always a very good latency in terms of what's happening in consciousness to tell what's going on, to discern it. So I'm always interested in forms of artistic expression in contemporary culture and what they're saying about where we're at, where the soul is at, where consciousness is at, what's emerging in the future. So science fiction for me, of course, I'm a big sci-fi fan as well, is a great place to explore a lot of these topics. I would say, you know, as a theme, and this, this would take some time to, to kind of dive into it, but I mentioned earlier, time is this realization of the a perspectival that 
this kind of simultaneity of all of history and all of becoming somehow the past, present and future are wrapped up in this multidimensional latent present. And we have access to that. This, this idea that time is not linear and that the complexity of networks is a good way of looking at the way in which time actually is, you know, it, it's this fascinating nonlinear association in which the present is influenced by the future as much as it is the past. And Gebser makes these claims all throughout the book. And I find it very interesting. And it has to do with an early 1930s insight he had. And he was looking for that in his own time. He saw in Picasso, for instance, like the ability Picasso had to sort of represent movement in a single image, different dimensions of, of, of a person who's sort of looking at you, but looking away, who's denoting kind of a side reel movement, but who's also coming towards you. This kind of concretization, right? He's, he was able to concretize, as Gebser describes it, to, to realize time in an image. And Gebser thinks that time is, is, is sort of a way into this simultaneity of integral consciousness. Um, so anywhere the time theme comes up in, in art and science fiction and storytelling is a good place to kind of check out, right? So I personally think, you know, some of the most popular culture examples are really good. And again, this is a digression, but <laughs> um, Interstellar is a great example. And I don't want to give the ending away or anything, but time is a very important factor in how that all works and how the future and the past and the present all work together. Arrival is another example. I absolutely love Arrival by Denis Villeneuve. These are cinema, but in terms of literature and science fiction literature, I would even look at Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation or Southern Reach trilogy. Mm -hmm. I mentioned in my book, Akira as a good example is a sort of expression of this push pull between the perspectival and a perspectival worlds. And we can kind of go into that too in a little while if you'd like. So I don't think these individuals have necessarily read Gebser, the creators of these works of art, but that's sort of my litmus test for, you know, any kind of theorist on consciousness is they're sensitive enough that they're not just abstracting this sort of hyper rational theory about how, you know, the mechanism of how reality works, but they're like an artist themselves and that they're really sensitive to this, this thing that's going on with people and, and it's going on with people. And so it's going to show up in their work, right? It's going to be a theme or a motif or a kind of a, almost like an archetype that's sort of playing out in culture. And so I would say, you know, this time theme of the relationship between nature and culture, sort of this kind of ecological oriented weird fiction, like I mentioned before, like Jeff Vandermeer, the sort of science fiction oriented, time oriented, past, present, and future. Those kinds of stories to me are, are very much trying to explore what it's like to live in a world where time is no longer linear and suddenly all of human history is rendered transparent to the rest of the biosphere, right? And perhaps, you know, even the invisible worlds, the occult worlds are suddenly, you know, rendered transparent to the, the waking world. So anywhere that that's showing up, I think is a good example. And I've only mentioned a few for, for sake of <laughs> brevity <Sure>. here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we are towards the end of the free portion of the chat. So I want to circle back to the structures of consciousness and just sort of tie that conversation up. You've talked around it. For the most part, you've mentioned, I think, all the structures on some level you've mm -hmm. touched on, but I just want to dig a bit more into them. So they are archaic, magic, mythic, mental, and integral. And then, as you say yes. in the book, each one is a fundamental reworking of what it means to be in the world and what the world is for us ontologically. So mm -hmm. take us through these structures and how Gebser uses them and talks about them and sees them, and then how you also maybe understand them now in hindsight and in, in this more maybe a perspectival world. So as, as Gebser mentions, these, these structures are, as much as they are historically relevant and observable in terms of, you know, you can look at, you know, the cave paintings of Chauvet in France and, and, and be moved by them and read anthropology books by, about them and try to understand it, as much as that's sort of a, an event in history, Gibson always points out that these structures are not just what's sort of visibly appearing in the world. There's a sort of a, a invisible immaterial dimension to them. They're kind of a, they have a spiritual origin, right? They have a, all of the structures, even the mental scientific materialist world has, has a kind of uh, spiritual origin to it. 
nevertheless, uh, we begin at the archaic and the archaic for Gebser is, it's almost, it's, this is the most difficult to talk about, but he uses a few kind of, how, how would you call it? A few cryptic descriptions borrowing from the Tao Te Ching and in Taoist literature where he's quoting them saying that, you know, dreamlessly the wise men, the ancient wise men slept or something around those lines, paraphrasing. And it's this idea of this kind of total identification of consciousness and world, of human consciousness and world. Everything is present, as we mentioned before, that since time is not linear for Gepser and these structural unfoldings, all of the future structures are latent. And Gepser's biographer and, and a scholar that I mentioned before, George Feuerstein, mentions this as the archaic is a maximum latency. Everything that is going to unfold into time and space and history is present, but it's latent. And he, he uses this example of this sort of unity of the earth and the sky. There's no distinction yet. And it's kind of difficult to kind of go into some of the details, but in the, uh, like Plato talks about this, and it's this idea that the soul is synonymous with the sky. And so the fact that the, the sky and the earth are not differentiated yet in this structure is a kind of a, um, a dormancy of the soul and the self. Everything is there, but it's sort of dormant, kind of like a deep, dreamless sleep where you can't even remember anything about that phase of, of the night. It's kind of just a, a blank void that you can't even recall being in. And then we get the magical. And for me, the magical is a good way to think about the explosion of art and creativity in not just the upper Paleolithic period in terms of historical manifestations, but just really what makes us human, right? Like creativity, ensoulment, imagination, just the explosion that we see in the, in the archaeological record of painting and sacred objects and the sort of creative imaginary world that we spring forth with and as a kind of a Cambrian explosion of, of artistry. And I mentioned J.F. Martel's book. He talks about this too. This, this sudden eruption of art in consciousness is a very good example of the magic. And the magic too is, you'll be familiar with it. I'm sure the um, listeners will be as well, because this is the kind of animistic world of humanity in which there's now a slight distinction between the human being and the world. There's not a total identification. Now we are the ones, you know, painting caves and performing rituals and doing spells for the hunt. And Kepser describes this structure as pars pro toto, which means, you know, one point for all points. The magical act in the moment for tomorrow is tomorrow as well. You know, it's, it's synonymous with each other. The spell is the world and the world is, is the spell. So there's this very direct participation in the world with our imagination, with spell crafting, with the human becoming animal, becoming human, right? And the kind of shamanic liminality. So there's a liminality in this structure. And in terms of its, its orientation to time, it's kind of a timeless liminality, right? That the world is simply being in this participation, this sort of human becoming animal, becoming human, right? And this, I, I have to say too, and one of the things I mentioned in my book is that the the magical structure can't really be seen on its own because even in some of the earliest cave paintings, we have star maps and we have lunar calendars. So the emergence, as I was mentioning before, that, that Plato just talks about, that the soul comes online with the stars, is this orientation towards cyclical time, the sort of understanding of the seasonal round, right? And, and um, the movement of the stars and the archetypal drama that we were talking about before, the stars signify the soul and the and the sort of interior psychic movements of the soul but they're not interiorized for sort of the magic mythic individual that they're sort of diffuse in the world and the self is is participating in this in this diffusive psychic reality that we were talking about before and so another aspect too is like between the magic and the mythic as well i mentioned the vaulted cave right the, the caves of the paleolithic are really good examples and we kind of carry those forward in terms of our image of the world the vaulted dome of stars, you know, we kind of saw the, there's these kind of layers of the cosmos that many in the in occult practitioners of hermeticism are familiar with. This kind of vaulted cosmology, it shows up all over the world. And there's an importance with acoustics and resonance, right? Marshall McLuhan describes this as the, the sacral man is, is an acoustic embodiment in the world where the world and the human being are participating with each other in this sort of acoustic simultaneity. 
So, you know, you have the Greek amphitheater and the sort of pre-literate oral cultures that all emphasize this importance of, of, you know, embodiment, acoustics, participation, so on. And so the mythical image is, is someone, and if the signifier isn't the point, it's the circle. It's sort of the, the round. It's the cycle. It's the season. It's the image of the sea as sort of the sort of oceanic, endless ocean of meaning and depth and gods and, and soul. It's a discovery of the human soul. Um, it's kind of narcissist kind of staring into the pool and getting lost in, in himself or, you know, the Greek heroes kind of traveling into the underworld to, to rescue and, and, and individuate. So that's sort of the mythical, just sort of a, a snapshot of it. And, and even in the mythical, though, as you get later on, and, and it's not just in, in Greece, but really, you know, you look at Sumer as well. And, and many cultures have a kind of ambivalent relationship with myth. In that, you know, there's a danger in these, these old gods, you know, they, they can eat you up. They can swallow you. You have to learn to navigate these powers and energies and forces. So humankind is always trying to, to, to stay afloat. And so Gepser points out Odysseus is this good, what he calls a mythology, right? Like a, a myth that's expressing some transformation of consciousness taking place. And he mentions Odysseus is when he says, you know, he, he wakes up on the shoreline in, in uh, the Odyssey and proclaims a little bit later on, M Odysseus. And Julian Jaynes talks about this as well as the, the lack of the I in that statement is very interesting. There's this kind of centering of the self and the soul, but it's not quite the modern perspectival ego that we have today. There's still this kind of liminality that's sort of a residue from the magical structure that's still kind of there. And then, of course, Zeus, right, births Athena from his head, sort of the eruption of the mental. And Athena can see through at night. She's sort of identified with the owl. So you're getting a lot of these mythical images that are expressing this dif differentiation between the soul and the waking world. And then that sort of the mental structure that starts to come online, the sense of time, linear time of, of Kronos, right? chronological time, time that marches forward, a series of patriarchs, right? A series of male gods that start to, you know, live on Mount Olympus and not necessarily, you know, we're not oriented towards the underworld anymore. And the ancestry and the realms of the dead were now interested in, let's say, the succession of the prophets and, and a future oriented eschatology with medieval Christianity. So we're getting this new sense of time that's emerging. We're getting a new sense of moving from mythos to logos with, let's say, you know, Athena is, go back to her for a moment. She's a good example of this break into the mental because she is kind of patron of Athens. And Athens, of course, you know, had the academy and, and the philosophers and the advent of the Greek alphabet and the movement into literature and writing that, that McLuhan talks about. And, and writing and, and the sort of autonomy, the sort of thinking self this thinking subject, this emergence of the ego, the spatial ego that starts to come online here, begins to distance itself from this imagistic and psychistic world that we were talking about and moves further and further and further into abstraction until we get in the Renaissance. Interestingly, Gepser doesn't say the mental is coming online in the Renaissance. He actually thinks, you know, there's a collapse, of course, in Europe and during the Dark Ages, and it sort of percolates for a while. And then in the Renaissance, it comes back online and for a brief moment, it's, it's kind of finally realizing space is sort of culmin the culmination of the mental is in the Renaissance, not the beginning. And then it moves into a deficient phase where it can only spatialize. It can only divide and measure and isolate and segment. And it kind of creates this crisis of consciousness that we're experiencing today where our sort of fundamental phenomenology is a kind of spiritual isolation you know we get the existentialists we get sartre and 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 camus and and this kind of relationship to being where it's it's scary and cold and, and you can be brave about it but there's a there's not a sense that you are connected to any kind of invisible or spiritual realm let alone ancestors right so there's this kind of through the unfolding of the structures that i've just been describing and their new relations to time space there's this increase of dimensionality of like you know one, two, three dimensions, two for like the mythical being kind of flat and unperspectival and iconographic, and three for the Renaissance and the mental being more spatial. But we lose another way of participating in the world. It kind of narrows down and withers until we're just this sort of isolated material ego in three-dimensional space. And that's all we are. You know, we're just sort of this hypertrophied ego.
And he has these like really kind of prescient descriptions for his time that work with our time where he's talking about social fragmentation to the point where a kind of a universal intolerance where everyone becomes their own little perspectival microcosm. They have their own little totality and no one's able to really connect with anybody else, let alone their spiritual origin. And there's this sort of a narrowing down of infinite fractioning of culture. And he describes that 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 kind of anxiety around that infinite fractioning and that isolation and that alienation all has to do with this fundamentally deficient and outlived structure, the mental rational structure that he describes. Um, And this sort of leaves us where we are today with like, okay, the inner goal, just to be brief, you know, the inner goal is is then it's inherited this crisis. and, And between many of these structures, they kind of, like I mentioned before, outlive themselves. They enter a crisis period and this new structure has to kind of leap forward. So the inner goal is this, all these things we've been talking about, this diaphaneity, this sort of appreciation of the whole, this moving beyond this sort of wakeful, spatial, materialist oriented self and kind of reclaiming the older structures because they're, they're erupting anyway. And I think part of the reason why they sort of broke forward in the 20th century is because of sort of the, the deficiency of the mental, you know, all of these older structures kind of arise forward in a kind of a hauntology. And the future begins to be a kind of, um, kind of orientation in a different way. It becomes a, something latent in the present. And so it's a move from abstraction into presence. It's a leap from spatiality to temporics and understanding and being aware of these older structures. And in that awareness of those older structures, there's now this new sense of being able to hold the whole, right? To, to, to wear the whole, as we were saying before, in this sort of intensified form of consciousness. To kind of sum it up with McLuhan, he's mentioning, we were talking about Odysseus, and he has um, a great book called Ulysses. You're talking about James Joyce's Ulysses, and McLuhan describes his media theory as um, applied Joyce, which I've always got a kick out of. But he describes this beautifully, and he, he describes sort of the electronic culture that Joyce is describing in, in Finnegan's Wake as basically what integrality is talking about. And, and he's saying, you know, all of the previous ages are now coming back, and we can kind of lapse into them. It's very easy. You know, we can kind of just, the, the waking illuminative world of the Renaissance and perspective can be just sort of, you know, recede like the tide. But rather than doing that, why don't we hold all of it together in a kind of a social kaleidoscope, right? He describes it as living simultaneously in all cultural modes. And Gebser has a very similar description for the integral structure. And so <laughs> that's ever present origin in a, in a <laughs> yeah. very, very quick download that will probably take a lot to unpack. Well, yeah. And, but that's what I wanted. I wanted to, to get those concepts out there for the audience, for sure. Uh, Jeremy, I do appreciate your time taking us through all that. Tell people where they can find you and your work and this book if they're interested. Well, thank you, Ryan. Uh, it's been great to be on the show. And people can find me on my homepage. It's just my name, Jeremy Daniel And uh, my Patreon is on there. I have a little Patreon. Uh, we do a monthly book club. So if you're interested in sort of plugging in with me and, and reading science fiction, that's what we mostly do. And people get a little insight into, you know, our articles and pieces of literature that I'm, that I'm working on and things I'm editing with Reveler Press as well. And um, I have a podcast as well, which is an outgrowth of all that called Mutations. And I think you can find that pretty much on any podcast app. Just look for Mutations and uh, you'll find it. It's pretty new. I've only got a handful of, of uh, interviews and conversations and solo shows, but there'll be a lot more soon. So thank you again. Thanks. This has been wonderful. No problem, man. Thank you for stopping by. And just to plug your podcast, I listened to the one with Michael Brooks, uh, I think yesterday or the day before. Really enjoyed it. You're doing some good work there. So I would highly recommend that as well to the audience. So Jeremy, thanks again for the time, man. Good luck with all of those hats that I mentioned at the beginning of the chat (laughs) and hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks, Ryan. You too. Take care. And there you have it. My thanks again to Jeremy Johnson. That is the epitome of what I like to call consciousness-enhancing audio. I guess that's literally what it is, enhancing our awareness of consciousness itself, at least from one other person's perspective. In the Patreon extension, another 25 minutes with Jeremy, where we talked about Gepser's concept of the word origin, Gepser's concept of time freedom, which I mentioned in the intro, also got into Westworld and finding Gepser's work in that TV show and mass consciousness shifts. 
and we wrapped up with the synergy between Gebser's work and recent guest Douglas Rushkoff's Team Human book. Pretty interesting and cool stuff there from Jeremy. And a shout out to new patrons who hopefully enjoyed that extension. Matt, Yoris, Timothy, Celeste, Kale, Major, and to returning patron Kat. Many thanks and much love to you guys who support the show in this way. It does make it easier to keep this going on my end. So if you want to help out monetarily month to month, patreon.com slash rollculture is the place to do that. There'll be another Raw episode coming soon for $5 plus patrons. We'll be talking about Terry Gilliam's film, The Man Who Killed Don Quixote. Yes, the whole world is talking about Avengers Endgame, but I decided to find someone to shoot the shit on Terry Gilliam instead. I know, I know, what a loser I must be. <laughs> anyway, there are other ways to support the show if Patreon isn't your jam, PayPal, Bitcoin. You can leave a review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast app of choice. Or just share the show on social media, screenshot it and throw it on your Instagram story. Any way you can support and spread this self-love virus is appreciated. And that is it for me this time. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.